Let's give a confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let us greet one another. Let us be equipped with the eternal power. With that, the title today is The Core of a Walk of Faith. Last week, the 27th World Remnant Conference was held at Kintix and Ilsan under the theme Eternal Inheritance, Masterpiece and Legacy. Over 17,000 people from more than 70 countries attended and about 1,000 remnants from our church participated and held on to the covenant. The WRC that is held once a year is basically like a festival for Tarakbang movement. It's really the most beautiful festival in this world. And the first lecture was about the internal inheritance. So what does that mean? Turn all of your thoughts, everything, into prayer. All your worries and concerns and your thoughts into prayer. So prayer, 24 hours. And the second lecture was about the eternal masterpiece. How do you make a masterpiece of God? When you make a masterpiece, you need to be concentrated. So it was about the limited concentration. Concentration on the word and on prayer. And the third lecture was about eternal legacy. In other words, the one who is equipped with the power to change the age is the one that will leave behind the eternal legacy or has the eternal legacy from the Lord. So it's been five years since we held the WRC at Kintex, and it was really the greatest festival. Externally and internally, we may be facing constant attacks from Satan. However, we were able to really hold the greatest conference and festival among us. From beginning to finish, a lot of people were asking who, who put this conference together. It was so amazing. And turns out it wasn't even specialists in their fields. And so it was really a time of oneness for us. It was a festival of the community of the people of heaven. So afterwards, I was talking to Rev Ryu, and he said that even within these times, God really put together the greatest masterpiece among us. So really, for each of you as well, I hope you really enjoy happiness in your life. Really enjoy this festival and feast inside of your lives. Because being alive in itself is really a blessing. We wake up every day, it's like a resurrection. So every day we have this resurrection. You must be overflowing with thanksgiving in order to be joyful. So really be thankful and joyful in your lives every day. Today's scripture is one of the discussions that took place after Jesus entered Jerusalem. And so the discussions that took place were about various topics. And the Jewish leaders, seeing Jesus cleanse the temple, they decided that they could no longer leave him unchecked. And so they decided they wanted to kill him. And so in order to find a fault in Jesus, they attacked him with various issues and various topics. So they questioned Jesus' authority. And beginning from there, they debated taxes, they debated the resurrection. And so with these various topics, they tried to trap Jesus. The authority debate was led by the chief priests, scribes, and elders. And the tax debate was led by the Pharisees and Herodians. And the resurrection debate was led by the Sadducees who emphasized that there was no such thing as resurrection. And so simply put, the Jewish religious leaders completely became oneness together. They were usually people that were hostile to each other, but they became united in their opposition to Jesus, trying to corner him with diverse controversies to kill him. 
So no matter what it took, they tried to create some kind of controversy. However, with every question that Jesus received, he answered them so wisely and clearly that they could not respond. And among that in today's passage, one scribe asked Jesus a question. And the question asked, which of the commandments the Jewish people kept, like their life was on the line, was the greatest commandment? So Mark reveals that this was not asked to trap Jesus, but rather this question was a genuine concern and issue within Judaism. That's what Mark reveals. So seeing Jesus' wise answers about taxes and about the resurrection, this one scribe who saw all of that, he thought Jesus' answers were really wise and astounding. And so the scribe was curious about one thing. And that scribe in the scripture asked, which commandment is the most important? So if we apply the scribe's question, which commandment is the most important of all to ourselves today, it could be, what is the greatest priority in life? Or what is the essence of living a walk of faith? Just like the title of our sermon today. What is the essence of living a walk of faith? What is the core? The most important aspect of a walk of faith is holding on to the right spiritual standards, the correct spiritual standards. This is not a gathering of people. It's not a gathering for fellowship. It's not a gathering for people to judge each other and ha have debates with each other. A walk of faith, the very first most important thing is for the glory of God. It's giving worship. And so the most important thing is having the correct spiritual standards. You do not change just because you attend church. You need to hold on to the correct standards. Really, when you come before God, you must have the correct spiritual standards. So in other words, knowing the core ensures that we will not be shaken. What is the core of my walk of faith? Why do I live? You must know this very accurately. And so through today's scripture, I bless all members of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to accurately grasp the core of a walk of faith as taught by Jesus and live a walk of faith that is true enjoyment and growth. The first main point, love God. Verse 28 reads, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? One of the scribes came and asked Jesus a question about the commandments of the law. And the Hebrew term for scribe is sofer, which means professional copyist. So it's a professional. And these scribes primarily copied, preserved, and taught the law. So as a result, they became very knowledgeable about the law. However, the problem was that they prioritized creating and following their own regulations over understanding the spiritual meaning of God's word. So they did not hold on to the core of what the word was saying or what the Bible was saying or the core of the work of faith, but rather they held on to the introductory things, the introductory things that they can see with their own eyes. And so they focus on ethics and morals rather than the core of the work of faith. They held on to their own regulations. They completely lost hold of the main things regarding life and death. 
And at the time, there were 613 ordinances in Jewish law. And this number was derived from the 613 Hebrew letters of the Ten Commandments. That's, what, that's why they created it in this way. And these were then divided into 248 positive commandments, basically saying to do something, and 365 negative commandments saying do not do this. And so the 248 number represented the parts in the human body, and 365 represented the number of days in a year. However, it was practically impossible for people to keep all of these 613 ordinances. There's no way someone could keep all of those things. And therefore, even among themselves, there was much debate among which commandment should take priority. So understanding this background, we can see why the scribe asked Jesus which commandment is the most important of all. We can understand why they asked that, because they really do not know what is most important. And so Jesus responded clearly to the scribe's question. Verse 29 to 30 reads, Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and your all your strength. Jesus stated that the first commandment is to love the one and only Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The first is to love God, is what he is saying. And this teaching is the core of the Shema, which is found in Deuteronomy verse chapter 6, verses 4 to 9, which the Israelites recited and memorized from childhood. And so the term Shema means hear or listen. And so the passage in the scripture today also begins with hear, O Israel, or Shema Israel. It begins with the words hear, O Israel. And so what we must grasp from today's scripture is how Jesus emphasizes loving God and how we must love God. In verse 30, the word all is repeated four times. It is repeated four times. And this indicates to pour out wholeheartedly and completely. In other words, God does not desire a limited and partial love from us. But he desires love that is 100% pure. That's the love that he wishes to receive. 100% loving God. So it's not about loving God and loving the, wor the world. To the point that God even says, do not love anything else. Above all things in this world, you must love me. In Hebrew, the word for love is ahav. And this term ahav means the love that is given with all of one's heart, undivided and exclusive. That's what it means. So in our contemporary terms now, it means loving God with one heart, whole heart, and continuation. Why does Jesus say it to this extent? Why must we love God in this manner? Because God is the one and only God. This is not a relative uniqueness, but it is an absolute uniqueness. And so there is no true God besides God himself. There are many gods in this world. There are so many gods. There are so many spiritual teachers. And there are many spiritual leaders within heresies, heresies that say that they are God. And there are so many idols of Mary. You go to Europe and you see so many idol statues of Mary. There is no God besides God himself. And yet people bow down before idols. 
God is the only one who can grant us salvation. And yet people have created so many gods. That's why we have to emphasize the unique God and the only God because everything else, that's evil spirits. God created humans uniquely as well in God's own image. And God gave us the privilege of communion with Him and the ability to glorify Him. So we were meant to communicate with Him and we had the special authority to be able to give worship to Him. Only mankind were granted that blessing because there's no other animal on this earth that glorifies and worships God. And that's not just any ordinary special authority. The fact that we can give worship to Him right now, it's a special authority that even the angels are envious of. However, after the first man, Adam, sinned, all humanity fell into sin, despite the special authority that we received. And so mankind became separated from God and faced a destiny of wandering and ultimately hell. And so sinful humanity or sinful mankind cannot restore itself. And so God provided a way of restoration, and that is only through Jesus Christ, the way of salvation. If it isn't for Jesus Christ, there is no way of salvation. An Sangong or Imani, they're not the way. Only Jesus Christ is the way of salvation. It's not Mary either. And so this way of salvation is the manifestation of God's amazing grace and love. That's why Romans chapter 5 verse 8 declares, But God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How do we have assurance that God loves us? Through Jesus Christ who was crucified on the cross. God killed His only Son on the cross and so that we would receive salvation. That's how we are able to have confirmation and assurance of God's love. So God's love was made concrete through Jesus Christ. He delivered us from sin, curses, and Satan's grip through His atoning death and resurrection. We don't have curses anymore. Those who believe in Jesus Christ, there are no curses for us. And so I was talking to one deacon, and the deacon said, Oh, I'm so unlucky. And I said, Have you received training? And they said, They have. And I said, Then why would you say that you're unlucky? And I said, We are not, we do not have such thing as luck or being unlucky or coincidence. We actually only have the power to call on the angels of the Lord because we are within the spirit the absolute sovereignty of God. Whether we live or die or we are in a high place or a low place or everything that is opened or closed, everything is within the absolute sovereignty of God. So do not blame yourself too much for your faults. Just think, oh, God is God is doing this himself. At every beginning and end of an incident, think to yourself, oh, God is doing this. Why would God be doing this? Don't think, oh, I'm like this. Why am I like this? There's no answer to those questions, and Satan will be joyful that you are asking those things. Just think of God's absolute sovereignty, and that way you will come to an answer. Only then will you experience God who makes good of all things. And you must believe that you have been absolutely freed from all sin and curses. You have absolute liberation. And that's why the life of believers, it's like living heaven on earth. Even if you're in prison, you can enjoy heaven on earth. Other people might say it's like hell, but you must say it's like living heaven on earth. That's complete liberation. And therefore, as the ones who have received salvation, it is rightful, necessary, and absolute for us to love God. 
In our present age, however, we see many anti-biblical actions challenging God's incredible love and the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, and they seek to diminish the significance of Christianity. And currently, the Summer Olympics are being held in Paris, France, and there has been significant controversy over the opening ceremony. And so, a cultural performance parodied Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, The Last Supper. And they put that in the opening ceremony, but that became a problem. So in this performance, a drag queen appeared as Jesus and his disciples. And so France defended that as an act of emphasizing inclusivity and diversity. However, it was very clear that there was an anti-Christian motive behind it. And so Jesus imparted the wonderful covenant of salvation through his atoning sacrifice on the cross to his disciples during that last supper. Last supper. However, at the Paris Olympics, the spiritual significance was entirely overshadowed, and instead they emphasized the importance of LGBTQ plus rights instead. And so the performance included scenes where three homosexual individuals exchanged suggestive glances and embraced, and so they were glamorizing homosexuality. And so consequently, the Paris Olympics have been dubbed the Queer Olympics for LGBTQ plus individuals. And so this reflects a time where anti-biblical elements are highlighted under the guise of equality and freedom, rather than the uniqueness of the gospel. So Satan's strategy to deceive people is so cunning that we can easily fall prey if we are not spiritually awake. So in this age, may all members of Yewon Church maintain a spiritual stance of loving only God and living a life that adheres solely to the, to the absolute truth of the Bible. Do not listen to the words of other people. If you go to the region of Kochang, there's a Kochang high school where many people, many elites go to Seoul University. And they have a teaching there where it says, do not even listen to the words of your parents or adults, but believe in your own thoughts. And that doesn't mean to not listen to anything that your parents say at all, but basically they're emphasizing, do not listen to the but they basically they're emphasizing that your thoughts are more important above that and to not rely on anyone else. However, I really bless you in the name of the Lord to become absolute disciples of Christ by communicating with God through the message from the pulpit and really enlarge your physical and spiritual tents. The second main point, love your neighbor. Verse 31 reads, The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus cites the words from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, to explain the direction for those who love God. As the recipients of God's amazing grace, the love that we have received should manifest in our love for our neighbor, neighbors. Our neighbors are the people beside us, which of course includes your family, but also the believers of the church. You may think you only see each other once a week, but they are your neighbors. They are our believers. So the love of God must appear in your life as the love for your neighbors. You shouldn't be focused on doing evil deeds. That's not, that's not the actions of someone who has received the love of God and someone who loves God. Those who really love God, they cannot hate other people. If someone says that they hate God and they really dislike someone else, then they are not someone that loves God. 
Because those who really receive the love of God, they cannot have any kind of hatred for each other. They cannot condemn another person. And if you try to do that, God always tells my, me, God says, look at yourself. Really, try and hate another person and see if God encourages you to do that. If God does encourage you to do that, then that's not the word of God. That's actually the word of Satan whispering in your ear. It's, it's impossible to hate another person continuously. What did Jesus say? To even love your enemy. And Jesus said, if someone hits your right cheek, you should allow them to hit your left cheek as well. If we continuously to love God and confirm that love, then there's no way for us to have any kind of condemnation or jealousy or hatred or dislike towards anyone else. And yet Satan always gives that kind of heart inside of us to the point that there are people who kill their own parents or their families. And in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 to 21, it states, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We must love each other. We were made in the image of God and we received salvation of God. And you come to church, which means you are a child of God. Isn't that right? You are a child of God. And so even if you do not like that one person, that person is a child of God. And so the greatest love that God has given us is the love of the cross through Jesus Christ. If it isn't for the cross, we cannot receive salvation. And so those who really have the baptism of the cross inside of them, the greatest love that you can offer to your neighbors is the gospel of the cross. That's the greatest love we can give. The love of the cross, the gospel of the cross. And so it involves sharing the spiritual truth that Jesus Christ came as our Savior, per perfectly resolving all our sins, curses, and every problem from our past, present, and future. And so becoming a messenger of God's love that restores that spiritual life is truly loving our neighbors as ourselves. I have received salvation, so my brothers and my neighbors must receive salvation too. I have received forgiveness, so my neighbors should receive forgiveness too. I have received freedom, my neighbors should receive freedom too. That's the love you must have. And so the shame shamans that have received the love and salvation, they are so desperate to give this love to other shamans. And it's really the most difficult ministry that they're doing. And so when we look at Jesus' final instructions before concluding his ministry on earth, they, consi they consistently align with this direction. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 states, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to ho the whole creation. This gospel is the love of the cross of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's saying, proclaim the love of the cross. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 tells us that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We must give this gospel to the ends of the earth. And so regardless of the circumstances, we must live as gospel evangelists who restore lives. We must live a life that saves others, the life that raises up others. And verses 32 to 34 reads, And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So the scribe who asked the question clearly understood Jesus' answer. His curiosity and doubts were resolved completely with Jesus' clear response. 
However, the final part contains an intriguing statement. Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. What does this mean? It indicates that merely understanding is not enough to inherit the kingdom of God. So we do not know if the scribe eventually accepted Jesus Christ. But at this moment, it is clear that he is not yet saved. He has not received salvation yet. He was able to understand and realize accurately. However, there is something that is absolutely necessary to be able to believe and accept. And that's about accepting Jesus Christ completely as your master. That's the salvation that is necessary. And so I bless all believers of y e o One Church to become the absolute and ultimate practitioners of life-saving love for your neighbors. In other words, becoming the absolute evangelists. This is the conclusion. On the internet, there are many satirical expressions about the characteristics of Korean people that is observed by foreigners. And some descriptions include a tremendous nation that fights typhoons every year and yet suffers the same damage every year. And they also say the only nation that never falls out of the top three in cancer mortality rates, alcohol consumption, liquor imports, traffic accidents, and youth smoking rates. A mysterious race that maintains the world's top spot in early English education while its English proficiency ranks around 100th, yet still dominates prestigious global universities and a futile race that studies English for six years in secondary school and yet cannot hold a conversation with a foreigner. And so although it is satirical, these expressions are thought-provoking, and particularly the last point, why have we become a futile race, especially a futile race regarding English? We study it so much, and yet we cannot speak it. The reason for that is because there is no field. There is no field where we can use English. We have learned it. However, we only know it at a certain level of having it as knowledge, but we cannot implement it. And at WRC, the Vanuatu president attended. And so there was like a seat for VIPs. And so Review and myself and other leaders of the movement, t a r k b a n g movement, came in and said hi to the Vanuatu president. But we were greeting him, and yet we couldn't talk to him. None of us said hi or hello or how are you. We all just shook his hand. However, I was courageous, and I said, hi, how are you? But saying that one English word was so burdensome, it was so much pressure that no one opened their mouths. And we are the only nation that is like that. We cannot even say the words hello or hi. And spiritually as well, many people live similar futile lives. A spiritually futile nation. What does that mean? It means there's no field. There's no field to proclaim the gospel that I know. And that's why it feels awkward and unnatural to proclaim the gospel. And our mouths do not open to proclaim it. And that's why the church, we are launching the Start 2025 movement and expanding the four main tents so that we can restore the field for our believers. Do not live a life that is spiritually futile or a life that is spiritually unnatural. Really, you must restore the field so that you can ex- proclaim the gospel confidently and boldly. Your nature must change. So loving God entirely and loving your neighbor entirely, it's not different. What does that mean? 
I don't mean to confess that you love all the time. But it means that you must proclaim the greatest love of God, the love of the cross, to the people around you, to your neighbors, to your fields. That is what love is. And so I bless all Yewon believers in the name of the Lord to hold on to the fact that loving God and loving your neighbor is about expanding the tent of your fields. Let us pray. Father God, we give thanks that you have allowed us to gather here to worship you today. And as we worship you, we have realized once again what is the core of the walk of faith and that we must love God and we must love our neighbor. And most of all, we must proclaim the original gospel to the people around us. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.